Mushrooms um, are, for all of us, because you have specific forest types, you might have hemlock, you might have sugar maple, all these things. Mushrooms are the great unifier, because everyone should think about mushrooms and can do them almost anywhere. You almost don't need anything but shade, really, to get started in, in woodland mushroom growing. Okay, So we all have access to that. And I've even had people do logs in their, in their backyard in an urban center underneath their deck. You know, that's enough shade to get started. Um, the forest is the nicest place to do it. We don't always have access to that. So I want to go through mushrooms first. And I guess lunch is a little earlier than I thought. So we may work through a, a couple of these crops, and then we'll, we'll pick up after lunch. We'll see where we're at. But that's fine. Um, mushrooms are uh, not only sort of most accessible for all of you because of your, it doesn't matter what type of forest you have. Um, they're also one of the easiest things to get into in terms of very low labor and, and capital expenditure, okay? Uh, which is very nice. And um, it all comes back to the opportunity, which is a lot of small diameter pole wood that we can harvest to grow our mushrooms on. So, we never want to go into the woods and like shop for mushroom logs and be like, oh, that one looks good. That one. And old books will say, find the straightest, most perfect trees for your mushroom logs. The mushrooms don't care. They don't read books, first of all. <coughs> and their job is to decompose dead wood. So they don't care what it looks like. You know? And it doesn't have to be the perfect specimen. We want to leave those in the woods. I won't very much because there's not very many. Um, those are great, though, for your laying yard, which is where we lay our logs, where we put and set up our mushrooms. So I'm jealous that you have spruce um, plantings because I have all my mushroom logs in a sugar maple forest, which is great during the summer. It's very dense shade, but half of the year it's full sun. So I have to cover all my logs with shade cloth versus your spruce, your pine, your plantation that you're like, what do I do with this? Perfect place. The needles often have created a nice soft understory. There's not a lot of other vegetation. Great place to grow mushrooms. So you bring your hardwood logs in there. But unfortunately, the, the answer to your question is, yeah, they're mostly growing on, on hardwood species. Yeah, there's very few that grow, um, and then there's very few that we can easily cultivate. Right. So there's this many mushrooms in the world. <laughs> there's this many we can cultivate. <laughs> okay. Very small fraction of them. None of them are mycorrhizal that are easily able to cultivate, because that requires setting up a relationship. So if you, want, if you came here to grow truffles, I'm sorry, wrong class. You can, you can sign up for truffle seminars. They, do, are, they are offered. You usually have to sign a disclosure agreement, because you're not allowed to tell anyone else how to do it. It's usually several thousand dollars. You plant a hazelnut or oak orchard. You wait about 15 or 20 years, and you might get truffles. OK? Cool, but I'm going to talk about these mushrooms which you'll get this growing season or next year at the latest. Okay? And those are all decomposer mushrooms. So they just eat decaying organic material, which is great. That's so much easier to negotiate than the relationship of a plant and a, and a mushroom. right? That's the mycorrhizal. So we're not going to try to grow those. It's, that's hard to, to orchestrate. But feeding my mycelium to a dying log is very easy. Okay? So here's our trailer full of shiitake bolts. We call them bolts. I don't know why. They're three feet long, usually, about, just because that's comfortable for most people to carry them. You can really choose your length. Some people, for some reason, say, I'm going to do an eight-foot-long log, which sounds cool, but is very hard to move. Um, if you live in an apartment or something very small, you could also have very small logs. And what we do at our holiday market every year is we sell half logs. We sell 18-inch logs as, as Christmas gifts. And they, people love them. That's like the coolest. Like, Get to wrap up a log for your, you know, your dad and let watch him open it and be like, "What is this?" And then, at some point, it'll hopefully fruit. Um, so usually four feet, uh, sorry, three feet long, four to eight inches in diameter is about what we try to go for. But you can do bigger, you can do smaller, but I wouldn't go too small. And then lots of species to choose from. This is for shiitake. Okay, so shiitake, uh, roughly translated from Japanese, means mushroom of the oak. It was, it's traditionally been grown on the shi tree, which is an oak tree in Japan and Korea and China. But we found that it grows great on a lot of different hardwoods. So sugar maple, American beech is great. Hornbeam, hop hornbeam, ironwood, um, birch, all the birches it grows great on. Alder, chestnut, if you had a chestnut surplus. 
Um, sugar maple is the best. All but red maple are are good. Unfortunately, I know we're we're our our R and D department's working on red maple as a challenge. It will fruit shiitake, but it's not very good. Not very good, like not very productive, or taste not very productive. They taste good. Yeah, not worth your time inoculating. Unfortunately, we have a website, uh, Cornell Mushrooms. Dot org which we've been building out over the last few years. And if you go to that website, there's a list of spawn suppliers, which are like seed companies or nurseries for mushroom stuff. There's a how-to page, which has a fact sheet for every type of process, and a video to accompany it, so you can see someone doing it. I'm in some of them. Uh, and just a whole bunch of information that's a great follow-up to our brief intro to mushrooms here. Okay, um, So don't think you have to get every detail, because there's lots of reinforcements. All right. Um, generally, what we're doing when we when we grow any mushroom is we're taking the mycelium. Okay, not the so a mushroom is a the fruit and the spores are the like the seeds, but they're not really like a seed. They don't have any protective coating. They don't have any carbohydrates. They're just genetic information getting s dispersed, and they're microscopic. So it's very hard to be a propagator of of spores because it's hard to capture them. If you imagine capturing something that's invisible and then separating out from all the other invisible spores, like because you have other molds and yeasts and bacteria like floating around the air. right? That's a really hard thing to do. <laughs> so what we do is we propagate from the mycelium, which is that white, thready stuff. That's the body of itself. That's very easy to grow. Okay. So what you buy, for starters, unless you become obsessed with this and start growing your own, uh, which maybe one of us out of here will, but most of us will buy spawn, which is sawdust with mycelium, already colonized. This is grown in a sterile environment inside. Okay, This bag is, is, this has been brought out into the world. It just has this little patch that uh, lets some oxygen in. Mushrooms breathe oxygen. But it doesn't let anything else in because, again, there's spores floating. We're breathing them in and out right now. They're everywhere, right? And we know spores can be very good. They can make good food, but they can also be very bad. We, a lot of infections and things are from spores, right? So the name of the game is keeping the stuff clean. And so by buying it from a lab, they've done that work for you. And now it's ready for prime time. It's ready to go out into the world in this state. That's all you really need to know, OK? A bag of this is five pounds is about 15 to $20. And I'll tell you how much that'll, that'll inoculate, OK? But it's very inexpensive is the bottom line. It's actually way cheaper to support a company than try to do this yourself, because it takes Unless you have a, anyone have a sterile lab in their basement? OK. If you did, it would be easy, but I didn't think so. Um, it all looks the same. This is actually wine cap strafari, and you're going to get to take home some of this. This is your homework, is to grow mushrooms, whether you like to or not. So you have a little, you'll have a little spawn burrito to plant in your garden this spring. Okay. But it's the same idea. We take the mycelium, we give it a food source, and then we make sure it has the right conditions to grow. That's it, like anything, right? Anything we want to grow. We have to get the mycelium in contact with whatever food it wants and give it the chance to consume that before it's going to fruit. Okay? So for logs, we need to introduce the mycelium into the log. The bark is actually protecting it from other fungi, and you get the spawn in the log. So to do that, we drill holes. I know it's a little hard to see. Um, we drill holes generally about four inches apart. I'll draw it on here. So here's our bolt. So about four inches apart for a row. And then we do another row about two inches from that, and we offset it. So it's kind of like a diamond pattern. So four inches between holes, two inches between rows. And that generally works out to you know 40 or 50 holes in the log. It doesn't have to be perfect. This is where your personality comes out. Some people are like measuring every line. It really does not have to be precise at all. And then you put the mycelium into the log, into the holes. This is using uh, uh, sawdust. And you can either pack that in with a dowel, or you can buy these little plunger tools that do it really nicely for you. Or you can buy the mycelium in little wooden dowels that you just hammer into the holes. Okay. Then we wax over the holes to seal that log back up, keep the moisture in, keep other fungi out. And even things like 
birds and things from pecking it out. Um, if you leave the holes open, the mycelium won't, won't have a chance to eat through the log. So the catch with shiitake is, if, and you can go home today or tomorrow and cut logs and inoculate them if you want. Um, you can start any time. Um, you can inoculate any time of the year. The best is to really do it in the spring. So now through April. And I'll explain why in a bit. Uh, after you inoculate, whenever you do it, you basically have to let them sit. And as I mentioned, the mycelium has to grow through the log before it's willing to fruit. That basically takes six months of warm growing season like temperatures above 55 degrees. Mushrooms like it, like most of us, above at least 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So it needs to be that or greater to have really good growth, which means here and where I am in New York, you know, essentially we can count on June through October as our window. <laughs> if you haven't noticed, it's cold right now. Uh, and so we say six months for spawn run, but really the easiest way to think about it is a year from you've inoculated, they're ready to fruit because six months is usually at least winter. Okay. So if I do logs in May, then by next May, they'll be ready to fruit. Does that make sense? So you get into this rotation with your enterprise where you, every spring you do a few hundred logs, set them aside, you don't worry about them. The growing season starts, you pull the logs you inoculated last year, those are ready to produce, and you add them along with the ones that have been producing for the last two seasons. So once you drill one of these, they're good for usually three seasons, sometimes four, which is great. <laughs> you don't have to do anything again, but manage them and harvest the mushrooms, okay? Which is one of the best things about log grown versus you can grow mushrooms on sawdust indoors. We're growing at our farm, we do oysters on straw. They're really fast, they colonize in three weeks, but then they have a party, they fruit, and then they're gone. That's compost, and we have to start the whole process over again. So a bag of straw is only good for a month, and then it's, it's actually really valuable after that. It's myceliated straw, which everything on our farm wants, whether it's earthworms or chickens or, I mean, it's, it's valuable, but it's not gonna make mushrooms. These logs will, three or four years, will produce for you, sometimes longer. Um, the catch with shiitake and why it's one of those very few mushrooms you can actually cultivate is uh, because they will respond to, to soaking in water. So if you soak a log once it's ready, okay, so I have to wait that year and then you soak it for 24 hours in water, you will force it to fruit. Okay, none of the other mushrooms we talk about, you can't force them to fruit, they fruit when they want to. <laughs> And mushrooms like it generally in the spring and in the fall, and some like it in the summer, but you, you can't count on it. I can't tell a restaurant I'll have five pounds of lion's mane for you next week, because the lion's mane, I don't know it's going to fruit. It's, always a, it's a great surprise, but it's not something I'm building my farm business off of. Shiitake, we can get almost set our watch to the production, because you can soak it, and then within a week it'll fruit. So that's 24 hours in water. Colder the better, actually, but it doesn't have to be. It will still work. I wouldn't like, you know, <laughs> install a coolant system to keep it cold. But they did. There was actually research that showed the colder the water, the better the production. So we put them in. Whether it's a tank of water or a pond, this is the before after on the picture on the pond. The after was the logs were completely spread out to every possible edge of the pond, and we had to collect them all. This is natural, natural uh, bodies of water can be frustrating for soaking. We had a, a grower in the Hudson Valley who was really excited to dam up the creek as a soaking bed and then Hurricane Sandy came through and blew out the dam and so her logs ended up somewhere in the Hudson, you know. So if you use natural bodies of water, just keep in mind you're in that game. We use tanks because they're very containable. So the, the rule is you're, it's really just a bacteria issue. You want to get, everyone tests their water. Just like if you were farming and using irrigation water, as long as it's below the 200 colonies per unit, whatever it is, 200 is the threshold, then it's safe to use. Dirty is not a problem. It's just if it's contaminated, it's a problem because these are mushrooms are 96% water. So, so um, they will fruit within like at seven to 10 days. Usually after you soak, it varies a bit with the temperatures of the season. 
So in our, in central New York, we essentially, we start soaking in May because we're always hoping it warms up and it never really does till June. So our, our season is essentially, our reliable season is June to October. And then this year we got mushrooms until Christmas because it was so warm. They were still going. Some years I've had mushrooms in April, it just depends on the year. Very easy to, to get up into the production very quickly. Um, you know, you have that first year where you're waiting, but then uh, you can get uh, pretty, pretty consistent. We basically do somewhere between 20 and 30 pounds a week of shiitake. Um, this is not a, so a thousand logs is a really nice commercial scale level. It's not a, it sounds like a terrifying number. It's actually not that big because you're not soaking a thousand logs a week, okay? Um, this gets you up into the point when you could produce gross over 10,000 in income from just shiitakes, okay? So in New York State, I work for Extension, and this is our new target, is to get growers to think about 1,000 logs because they can qualify for tax exemption at that $10,000 mark. It's not to say that you couldn't do 500 logs and gross half that, right? Or you could do 100 logs and just add a few into your farmer's market stand. I don't care what size you do. But we're talking about 1,000 logs as a good, oh, I'm going to really do this and make you know, a decent amount of at least gross income <laughs> from it. You're, the way you get net income is you choose how you spend your time. Because <laughs> we see our growers, some, some make a lot per log and some make almost nothing. But I have a lot of reasons why, as with any farming enterprise, right, you make money or you don't. It's often the choices we make as growers. But um, so a thousand logs, we divide that. Who's got a calculator on their phone? I know someone does. Can someone pull it up? Okay. So a thousand logs, we're going to divide that by seven. Okay, so 142, we'll say. So that's 142 logs. Seven is, uh, we divide our logs into seven groups because it takes, from the time a log fruits until it's ready to fruit again, it takes basically seven weeks of rest. Because you, if you think about a log as like a car battery, if you soak it and encourage it to make mushrooms, that car battery is kind of exhausted and it needs to recharge. Okay, so. Rather than worrying about it and counting each log and being like, well, I soaked you then, I soaked you then, we just split all of our logs into seven groups of about 140 logs. And every week we soak 140 logs. Does that make sense? So by the time we've gotten, we just name them groups one through seven. And by the time we've gotten to group seven, group one's ready to go, right? Because we just, I can count to seven. I can't count to a thousand <laughs> and keep track of logs, but I can count to seven, okay? So we soak this many. Per week. All right, and we calculated, we did a three year grant with the University of Vermont, actually, at Cornell and Chatham University. We worked with 25 growers. They were gracious enough to keep track of all their expenses and labor around doing this. So we have costs based on that. And the spreadsheet, which again, you can look at the, I'll actually pass it out now. Um, you can look at the numbers if you're interested. Uh, and if, I, if you're on the email list, I can email you the actual spreadsheet, which means you can change the numbers and come up with your own figures, which is nice. And you can see in there, we've literally broken down every chunk of the labor as, as down to the tenth of an hour of how much time it takes. Very nice to have that tool. So you can tweak, tweak your numbers and figure it out. Um, takes about $4,700 in cost to establish this a thousand log operation. That includes your labor at twelve dollars an hour, by the way. And then it yield it will yield whoops um, about a thousand pounds a year in year three. Because we're not going to assume that you're going to go from zero logs in your backyard to a thousand. Usually people do two hundred or three hundred a year and kind of inch their way up to that a thousand. We have now a few growers who are, who are literally going from zero to a thousand, which is crazy. Um, takes a lot of work. But basically, that'll produce you about 1,000 pounds a year. So that's a, that's a nice summary. And so that's been our focus, is to get people on track to do that over three or four seasons so they don't get scared from it. Okay. So if we zoom back out from this, what's really cool to me about mushrooms 
is that if I cut a tree down and laid it down in the woods and just walked away, fungi would come in and colonize it and consume it and break it down. Chances are those fungi would not be very edible or delicious or medicinal, which shiitake is all of those things. So all I'm doing is I'm thinning the woods, I'm taking that tree and I'm putting the mushroom I want in it, which the mushroom that I can sell is high value, so it pays for my time to do that forest management. And I'm just facilitating that decomposition, right? It ends up going back in the woods anyway, but instead of having conchs on it, which are fine, and conchs, you know, mushrooms are fine. All mushrooms are great, they have their purpose, but I can be a lot more productive, right? Over that four years, I can produce a significant amount, about four or five pounds of mushrooms per log while I'm de decomposing it, right? So this is back to our website. I mentioned the, the, the films. The farmers we worked with, we all put together this really nice 30-page guide on shiitake, right? So there's the, there's the really good starting point if you want to um, drill down into shiitake, no pun intended. <clears throat> um, so marketing uh, is dependent, obviously. Um, we do, at our farm, we do a, we do a, a mushroom CSA, so we, we get people to sign up for a weekly delivery. We tack that on to an existing vegetable CSA, so it's just an add-on, and we've had about 30 people sign up for that every year. And then we sell the rest to restaurants wholesale, and that's a nice balance for us, but it depends on your area. I will just say, though, all over the Northeast, people have not had a problem getting rid of them. It's um, more a problem of not having enough supply. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and they dry great. Um, they dry, the best way to dry them is actually in the sun. They solar dehydrate really well. You can put them on a flat tray with a screen just to keep stuff out. And on a hot day or if you have a hoop house or greenhouse, they will um, dry up really nicely. And they, they'll, they'll last for at least a year that way. And the cool thing, if you ever want to Google uh, mushroom, shiitake mushrooms and vitamin D, and Paul Stamets. <laughs> Paul Stamets, if you're not familiar, is like one of the big mushroom proponents in North America. So probably if you Google Paul Stamets and vitamin D, you will find this cool article that talks about how mushrooms, when exposed to UV light, actually uh, increase their vitamin D content, two or 300 percent. So that's significant. Vitamin D is a very hard thing to find in our diet. Uh, you can actually basically create a supplement by solar dehydrating. Mushrooms. Yeah. So uh, one more style. So that's shiitake is pretty pretty cut and dry. Um, if you just want to do these other ones, they're really fun and they can be a good supplementary income source or just something for you to enjoy. And it's really fun to see as people get more creative and how how to use their wood lot. And again, it comes down to, okay, I just cut this tree. How do I get mushrooms involved? Basically. <coughs> so this is a grower down in North Carolina who cut a tulip poplar um, and came up with this idea where again we're just taking the mycelium we're introducing it to the to the interior of the tree and so all he would do is he'd cut out little wedges with his chainsaw and pack the spawn in and then nail that piece back all right and some people will cover the stump with a bag some people just leave it it's debatable um, and he was using oyster so poplar your softer hardwoods like poplar Uh, willow, cottonwood, um, elm, box elder are good trees to try with oyster. But um, poplar, um, quaking aspen, populus tremno tremnoides would be uh, your best bet probably up here. And that's often a tree people are like, it's not good for fire. What, what do I do with it? I cut it down. So grow oysters on it. Um, golden oyster is a really nice one to try on poplar. It's had a lot of good success. So he had $300 off that one stump. That's one stump in his backyard that had no value to him, right? He was like, I'm cutting this down because it's going to fall in my house. So that's it. Now suddenly it's a tree producing a lot of mushrooms very easily. That took him 10 minutes, right, to inoculate. Um, so you could do that wedge method. There's also on our website we talk about this totem method, which is where you take, so you take a log, and if, if you think about a two-foot log, cut it in half with a chainsaw, and then you cut a little one-inch cookie off the top. So I would take my mycelium, which is represented by blue, 
again, that sawdust, and I would sprinkle some there, in between this, and on the bottom. Okay. And then I stack this, and then usually it's recommended you cover this with a bag. And we found that with a two-foot log, a leaf bag, one of those paper leaf bags, works really great. And you just cover it up. And basically, by the time that leaf bag is starting to fall off, it's done its thing. We're just trying to keep it a little bit contained while the mycelium is colonizing the log. And then after about a year, probably the next season, it should flush and fruit. Okay, so that's called totem. So we call this a stump inoculation, which is existing on the stump. This would be totem, and then the shiitake would be a bolt. Yeah, I like to put a little piece of cardboard or a paper bag just so it's not in touch with the soil because other stuff could get in there, but it doesn't have to be. That's like the fancy version, yeah. Um, and you could really, you could, you could, the nice thing about this is you can move them anywhere, but you can also do them right in situations. So you could cut the tree, buck it up, and just tip these logs back up, right, and layer spawn in between each, each chunk, right? So the, and I should be clear on here, this doesn't need to be watered, it's just if you want them to fruit. You could just have shiitake sitting in the woods and they'll fruit on their own. The nice thing about logs is that they hold their own moisture. So they really, usually other than natural rainfall, don't need any extra water. Yeah, I would say in a, in a drought year or a drought month, uh, you want to have a backup plan to, to be able to give them some water. Um, we did, with our logs, what we did is we just, uh, the ones that were resting, we soaked for like an hour a piece just to rehydrate. If I had a sprinkler, I might just have you know, turned that on a few times just to give them some moisture. But they really, uh, they, they're, they're extremely resilient from drying out, which is nice. You just may not have that optimum level of moisture. That is sort of personal opinion. Some people do, some people don't. Um, I don't think it's necessary. Everything you do to block out the outside contamination is, is probably good. Wax is very expensive. So, and if you're way out in the woods, you're probably going to carry a hot wax plate with you. So it, that, all those factors kind of play in. I've also seen people staple, um, staple uh, wax paper over them. But the favorite thing, actually, the, the new method I'm going to try this year is um, a friend, of the, the same guy I was making fun of because he's too perfect with his, his drilling, uh, he takes his totems and he, he wraps them in wet newspaper. So he'll soak newspaper in a bucket and then wrap the whole log in it. And so that seals everything up. But the mycelium actually just colonizes the newspaper and it just helps facilitate the whole thing. And then it'll fruit out of that. I, that is far more labor than this totem or stump method. So generally for poplar, I'd say just do this. Because you don't get any, anything faster when you do it like this. And this, this is a lot more labor than this takes. So one of these logs to take it through the whole, it's like you set up a, basically like a, a, a workstation and you have this whole process. And, you know, to do one of those might take 20 or 30 minutes. To do one of the, you can do 10 of those in the same time because you're just, only for the shiitake because you're soaking and moving it. These, these wouldn't be soakable, right? So it's really just a different style. It's all the same principle, right? We're just putting mycelium in the log. This is just, exactly. Yep. No, it'll be, everything with logs is like a year or sometimes a little more. Yeah, there's no, there's no shortcutting the logs. It's a great question. So uh, the question was about if you don't have access to bolts, which I said we've thinned our woods, but that's only given us 500, which is not nearly what we need to keep in production. So we buy bolts. Um, the going rate is generally speaking, depends on where you are. I mean, it's a very new thing to sell mushroom bolts. It's one to three dollars a bolt. <laughs> and I think that based on the, the the logger I work with, he does a lot of habitat restoration, and that's where he gets mushroom bolts. He's thinking around like 250 is what is economical for him. So 250 a bolt, it increases your overall price a bit, um, but it decreases your labor. So we actually haven't figured out the difference. That five dollars of cost is probably maybe just a little bit higher, but you see the margin is still pretty good. So I would say if you're buying bolts, you're not losing it, and and it all depends because if you aren't a chainsaw uh, wizard, 
if you don't have the gear to pull logs out of the woods, um, I know I can go into the woods and if I mess up one tree, I could stay, spend the rest of the day trying to get that one tree down. So I've made 10 bolts in one day and a really good day I could get 100. So sometimes buying it is cheaper because you cut out that variable, right? The person you're buying them from can deal with the, the monkeying around in the woods. So that would be, it's, that budget is reflected on you harvesting your own log. So it's assuming um, I do the work. It's a little different, yeah. But I, I tracked my labor for, for two years, and it was actually cheaper both years to, um, to buy them. So <laughs> yeah, I think it's a good emerging market, actually, to buy. So the best wax to use for shiitake, or anything, really, is cheese wax, which Again, the mushroom supply companies, which on the cornellmushroom.org has, a, we have a list. It's not everyone, but it's the, some of the bigger ones. <clears throat> um, they sell that, and the benefit is it sticks to the log really well. If you use paraffin or beeswax, it tends to either fall off or get eaten. Like beeswax, actually, animals will eat it off, <laughs> which kind of defeats the purpose. So cheese wax works good. Yeah. It does. If you leave your yeah, if you leave your wax simmering and forget about it, it will create a grease fire, basically. So, so um, back to the this conversation. It's the same as like where am I getting my spawn from is a really key thing, and I'm gonna buyer beware you all again because there's a lot of uh, spawn production companies popping up. Because just because you can produce a bag of Mycelium in a in a lab in a con, in a controlled environment does not mean it's it's going to thrive in the field. Does that make sense? So, um, if you're going to get into the shiitake business, make sure the person you're buying spawn from has grown their shiitake on logs and has good a good track record of production. <laughs> that may seem really obvious, but I think you go online and you see someone making mu mushroom mycelium, you're like, oh, they must know what they're doing. It's sort of like nurseries. You have nurseries that people are just getting started. They don't have that 40 years of a library built up. So you're going to get the, a, a proportional product, right? So it's the same with the spawn. So that could be your first problem, is potentially where you source your spawn. And th the only reason I say that is because a lot of people um, feel like they did something wrong, and it may not be. It may just have not colonized. Um, so with a lane yard, shade is the number one thing you need. The more, the merrier, and ideally year-round shade. So conifers are the best. If you have a, a coniferous grove that keeps that shade, you know, thin out that old spruce plantation that you can't barely walk through, and it's a perfect little mushroom grove. Um, what we do at our, we, we, we have all in a sugar bush, so it's, it's like I said, sunny now. Um, so we cover everything with shade cloth, like our agricultural shade cloth, that's fine. And you can technically create shade structures with shade cloth, but it's not the same as in the woods. The woods creates a nice humidity as well. So the second, this is really all for all mushrooms. Um, temperature, uh, light, humidity, and air are the four things you have to pay attention to. All right, temperatures. Um, Temperatures need to be, I mentioned, above 55. And most, this is Fahrenheit, and most tank out around 90. But <clears throat> that's some really tropical friends that we can cultivate. Really, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a peak. We, they really like like 55 to 75 degrees. Light, um, generally you want uh, 80 to 90% shade for your mushrooms. Humidity, you basically want above 60%. And air, air's a tricky one. <laughs> you want air flow, but you don't want so much wind that it's actually drying things out. And this gets a little bit into like, if you got into indoor cultivation, like if you were to grow mushrooms in a hoop house, one of the problems is that if you don't have good fresh air coming in, the spores will actually overload the space as they're fruiting and shut down production because mushrooms won't produce 
if there basically isn't enough oxygen and, and fresh oxygen. But in an outdoor log setting, that's not much of an issue. You just want to think about if you have a really windy site that there's a bit of a windbreak to protect them. So drying out could have been a possibility. <clears throat> um, yeah. So that might be the, the next thing is to figure out a way to create some kind of windbreak. And I've seen them out of pallets and you know, something you build. And also, I've seen them uh, you know, planted over time as well. Humidity, a little too much light. <clears throat> so you need to put shade cloth over the greenhouse. That's what we do in our greenhouse, is put shade cloth over. So yeah, you find the balance between those things. Generally, the nice thing about logs is that you put them in the woods. You think about a, a, a conifer wood, wood lot. That's like, like, ideal, as long as there's not a lot of wind whipping through. So it has the right temperature during the growing season. <laughs> it has the right light, has the right humidity, and, and has you know, some airflow. Um, the advantage of when I don't work for Quadro Extension is that I can tell you my preferences, which is today. <laughs> Some days when I'm at Cornell, I'm like, I can't tell you. I don't have a preference, which is not true. So <clears throat> for shiitake, um, the folks that have been doing it for the longest are Field and Forest, which is in Wisconsin. And they've specifically focused their business around log-grown mushrooms. So they're always geared towards like what's the best for logs, which is important. For, uh, for oyster, for indoor cultivation, um, I really like my Mushroom Mountain, which is in South Carolina. It's Trad Cotter, who also wrote a book called Organic Mushroom Farming and Mycoremediation. So that's more for indoor. He's done a lot more with uh, <clears throat> shiitake for indoor cultivation and oysters. <clears throat> oyster, if you go indoors or in, in controlled environments like hoop houses, oyster is the one you want to focus on, and there's a million different options there in terms of the color of the mushroom and also what you could grow it on. You can grow oyster on almost anything that's carbon-based. And now I want to add a disclaimer. Those, those two companies have been doing it for a long time, so that's good. I don't want to just like discount, and I have friends and people starting mushroom businesses that are very reputable, so I don't want to um, say that you should only go to the old timers and not, you know. So the other consideration is that my hope in the long-term evolution is that Every region in this country would have strains of mushrooms well developed to their locale, right? So, getting spawn that might be work well in Wisconsin or South Carolina may not be the best for me in New York or Vermont. So, checking with who's locally producing spawn and having conversations is great. So, I know <clears throat> for a while Wild Branch Farm was selling spawn. That's great for Stropharia, for, for instance, which is uh, we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, Fungi Ally is in Western Mass. They're just getting ramped up in production. I th I'm really excited about what they're doing. In Rochester, New York, there's Smugtown mushrooms, which they do a lot of indoor and urban cultivation, so they're good for that. Um, but you know, seek out those people in your community, because ideally, we did a research project at Cornell where we had the field and forest lion's mane, and then we actually harvested locally two wild lion's mane mushrooms. And our, our grad student isolated those, made the spawn, basically, and c cultivated those side by side with the one that she could get from Field and Forest. And the one from New York outperformed the one from Field and Forest, like twice as productive. So local, ideally, like a mushroom from Vermont would be the best one to grow in Vermont if you're out di outdoors, right? It makes sense. Um, but we're not there yet. It's not that diverse. Um, you think about all the breeding that's gone into apples and tomatoes, where, like mushrooms is just getting started. So, you know, generally it's best to put one strain in one log. It might work, but generally it's best to do one. Yeah, you don't want to create competition necessarily. Yeah. So, Stropharia. So, I should say that um, we talked about bolts, okay? And we talked about shiitake, is, this is really the bolt method. Namiko mushroom could be the bolts. <clears throat> for totems, excuse me, this oyster or um, lion's mane. I've been mentioned this weird lion's mane mushroom. If you haven't seen that, it looks like a white pom pom ball. Um, very odd, bizarre looking mushroom. Very beautiful, tastes like lobster, like absolutely delicious. Very easy to find in the woods around here, like sugar maple and beech. So you can grow those on totems. Okay. So that's three species, shiitake, oyster, lion's mane. Okay. The fourth species we're going to mention is, is Stropharia, or red wine cap, as it's sometimes known. And this one likes, <clears throat> likes it in wood chips. OK? 
Okay. So anywhere you're already mulching with wood chips is the best place to <coughs> grow Stropharia. Don't make a bed just for Stropharia. It actually, my assessment is that it likes, it likes to hang out with plants. It likes to hang out in a diverse soil ecology. So just a bed of wood chips is not as good as your forest garden that you're planted or the mulch ring around your fruit trees or your, even your perennial flower beds that have permanent cover. That's great, okay? Um, they fruit in not only the darkest of the dark, but also in pretty full sun, like garden sun conditions where it's pretty much full sun with some you know, shading of the, of the ground from plants. So there's a lot of potential to integrate this into other forms of production, which is nice. And what's happening here is similar to shiitake. You've now inoculated your uh, wood chips or your straw with a mushroom that you want to eat versus the ones that will just come in. And at the same time, you're breaking down those wood chips faster. So you're actually cycling organic material faster in your soil, which is awesome. So I think there's a lot of potential <clears throat> to see like this production co-mingle with like different vegetable production or different fruit production, right? Um, basically, you're going to create like a lasagna. So again, we're going to take the mycelium and expose it to, uh, to the material it wants to eat through. So we start always with bare ground. And so that could mean uh, stripping away a sod layer if you have grass. It could mean just moving your wood chips temporarily aside if you already have an established bed, okay? Or maybe even sometimes you're tilling a space and then you're going to put it into a mulch and that's fine as well. But you want bare ground. You don't want a lot of vegetation to start, if that makes sense. Don't rip out your apple trees and things, but just like kind of, uh, you know, low level vegetation, all right? And then. Uh, we put down a layer of ideally sawdust, if we can get our hands on hardwood sawdust, not soft wood. That can be tricky sometimes. A lot of the feed stores sell you like pine shavings or pine sawdust, but you really need hardwood stuff. It doesn't matter what. Um, I wouldn't use locusts though. So I guess it does matter, anything but locusts, because <laughs> it's rot resistant, right? Uh, and then... Uh, on top of the sawdust, we'll do a layer of wood chips. I'm sorry, the spawn itself. I missed that. <laughs> it's important. So you sprinkle the spawn on top of this sawdust. And then you put your wood chips or your straw on top. That's it. Took me about, takes you about as long to inoculate as it took me to explain it. right? So generally, it depends on what you have, but I would say at least an inch of sawdust and you know two to four inches of wood chips. And I say wood chips because I found that to be the best uh, to weather both dry, really dry conditions and really wet conditions. Straw can sometimes get kind of soggy if it's depending on its water holding. It can be a mix, so um, it still should have some hardwoods in it. I go to the town pile and get wood chips a lot, so that has a mix. I don't, it shouldn't be all softwood though, but a little bit's okay. Yeah, it just tends to not be as into it. It tends to, actually you'll see the mycelium like move around it and then it might come back. Yeah, okay, so that's really in bed cultivation. There's others you could potentially do in there, but that's the easiest. These are very beautiful red capped mushrooms and taste very like, much like portobellos. Um, they tend to have a shorter window from, they don't, like shiitakes are a very robust mushroom that as they're fruiting will hold their form. The stropharia tends to have its glory and then die back very quickly. So you want to get this started where you are traveling frequently. So you see, see the flushes because these are going to fruit whenever they want to. You have no control over it. So often after heavy rains, often after big swings in temperature, those are the types of things that often trigger mushrooms. And the same with the totems. They fruit when they want to, often fall or spring, often when those dynamics, moisture or temperature dynamics are happening. Are these a one year big fruit too? These I've seen work in as little as two months. Sometimes it takes a whole year. It just really depends on how the world's working. Yeah. I've grown strafaria in trays. It's, it's really good to like do these and then like think, if you think about the bigger theory, then you can really go nuts. So one year I did, I was doing a mushroom class in like November and I was like, well, I'm not going to plant this outside because it's too cold. Um, 
the mushrooms will do fine over winter once they're established, but you don't want to start them off in you know, November or December. So I did it in a, a Tupperware bin just to show the layering to a class. And I was like, this is fun. And I like, took it home and shoved it under my mattress, you know, under the bed, and didn't think about it. And like, looked at it a month later, and the whole thing had colonized with mycelium. I was like, OK, I guess I better divide that up. So I put it in four bins with fresh wood chips and sawdust. And a month later, they were all full, and they all fruited. <laughs> And by the end of the winter, I had from one five pound bag, I had 15 <laughs> totes full of Strophoeria mycelium that then I put out in our, in our beds. And now we don't even inoculate. They just show up every year and they show up. You know, we, we, we miss some, we inevitably miss some of the harvest and they just are spawning and, and, and inoculating everything. So we don't know where they're gonna show up from one year to the next. They're all over the garden. They're all over our, our perennial beds. They're just kind of feral at this point, which is great. Um, so they're a really fun one, and you can, you, know, you can do tray culture, you can do them in buckets. There's a lot of different ways you can grow, especially stropharian oyster. They're the most fun to kind of experiment with. So you can just, if, it's, if a whole bed is colonized, and we recommend starting small with a bag to do like a four foot by four foot space, so it, it colonizes really well. Once it's flushed once, you can take, say this is your bed, you could just take a chunk of it and do this layering with new stuff in a new spot, and it should so it's nice to put it somewhere where you're already watering too, because if you're, if it's a dry time, you're probably watering your fruit trees or whatever too, right? So, so we've built our entire farm enterprise off shiitake, and then we know who like a few of our restaurants are like. Whenever you have those crazy yellow mushrooms, let me know, and we just bring them and they buy them. And I think last, it's actually on the sheet. I think last year it was, I mean, it was a very low amount of. So if you look down on the front. You see other, shiitake, oyster, and then other. So in 2015, we did 23 pounds of oyster off totems, five off lion's mane, uh, 18 off stropharia, and 15 we wildcrafted. So when you do the numbers, that's, uh, it, you know, that does not compare to the 450 pounds of shiitake we did, but it's significant in terms of you know, bringing in some income. Yeah, so we do, we pretty much do 11.50 a pound at, re at wholesale, and our CSA members pretty much pay 16 a pound. They, we just don't tell them to them like that. <laughs> so eight dollars a week sounds better than 16 dollars a pound. <laughs> it's not a lie. It's just, it's just the same thing. And if you go to a farmer's market, you never want to put your mushrooms out at 16 dollars a pound. You'll terrify people. But if you put out a pint of mushrooms, which is about a quarter pound for four dollars. Nobody has any problem. And you're not being dishonest. It's just it's all our perception around what something costs. It's very valuable. I think they're worth it. So we want to keep those prices there. Yeah. So, and this is where the spawn companies will sell you spawn. But you're probably just as, just as you know, lucky putting blank sawdust into a stump and hoping it fruits. Like, no one's had good luck with reishi, maitake, chicken of the woods. Those are best wild foraged at this point. <laughs> My theory is that it's not because of the mushrooms, it's because we haven't worked with them long enough to have the, the methods figured out. But everyone wants to know how to grow morels. Morels are like a, the, the most specific mushroom you could possibly choose to try to grow, other than truffles, probably. <laughs> so the conditions have to be right, the soil pH, the, probably there's bacterial interactions in the soil that create fruiting conditions. I mean, it's literally, there's so many things to line up that it's, you know, anybody's guess versus these are much more reliable. Yeah. And I'll just mention then that uh, straw, if you want to get into oyster production, straw or other mediums are great. We've been really interested in the concept of, for instance, harvesting uh, invasive brush as we work on our forests, chipping that and growing oysters on it. That would be like the perfect thing to tie it back into the woods. Oysters will grow on anything. So if you have any waste on your farm or in your enterprise, try to feed it to oysters. <laughs> Because it'll help. It'll it'll help, and you could potentially produce another another product. Um, occasionally, but not a huge issue. The big issue is with slugs, which I'll I'll loop back around to later this afternoon. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. So we've uh, sold the half ones for I think ten or fifteen dollars at different times, and the full ones for twenty dollars or so usually. Um, 
that's as again you will get in a in a good log you'll get twenty dollars in profit of mushrooms off of it. So if you sell the log for twenty bucks, you've made the profit without doing any of the work other than inoculating it, which is nice. <laughs> um, there's a few people I actually set up lane yards for, so they paid me to do the logs and set it up and explain them how to do it, which is cool. And there's a grower now in the in Western Mass who's almost exclusively just selling inoculated bolts. And he's really into it and people love it. I think it's a great way to educate people about this management and, and there's definitely an interest. I think you couldn't sell 100 to a farmer at $20, 20, $20 a log. You'd have to go down. Yeah, totally. I think it's a great, people love it. Especially if you bring one that's fruiting. Yeah, it's a great product. All right, anyone, we can just talk about mushrooms often.